Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University, and welcome to Vlog 2, 3, 2. <laughs> Jargon. Jargon. This is the end of the Doug trilogy, exploring the nature of academic writing. And the final request of me from Doug, you're a legend, Doug, was about the nature of jargon. And it is a juicy word. When you think of jargon, you may think of gobbledygook or nonsense. That's part of the definition. But we're going to explore a diversity of combinations and ideas about jargon today. So this may not be the vlog that you think you are going to hear. And let's think about the use of jargon in our culture. There's all sorts of adjectives that appear in front of it. Military jargon, legal jargon, academic jargon. Right. So as you can see, the word jargon has denotative and connotative tendencies. And you may think that those two words actually are jargon in and of themselves. We'll come back to that in a sec. But connotation, the ideology of jargon, the second order of meaning of jargon, is that it is obstructionary. Jargon blocks meaning. It blocks clear communication. And that may be exactly how you think about the term. And this rendering has some good history to it. It comes via the etymology of the word jargon, actually, from the Latin, which referred to chatter. So it's sort of chatter, right? But the denotation, the more neutral meaning of the word jargon, the first order of meaning, if you will, is that it involves distinctive, special, specific, and specialist phrases that resonate in a distinctive context. Okay, so jargon is specialist language and specialist terminology. Right, so this means that jargon is situated in specialist communication systems, specialised contexts, and that means therefore that jargon may not and probably will not travel effectively to other contexts. Okay, now in anti-intellectual times, and trust me, we are living in anti-intellectual times that doesn't like clever people, academics, scholars, not even too keen on experts. The word jargon can be used to express anger or rage or dismissal at difficult ideas. So to use the great Australian just, it's just jargon. Just obstructionary language, not interested in that. Those clever people over there, they think they know what they're talking about, but we know what we're talking about. You with me? So the rendering of the word jargon is a way to deny expertise and maintain a state of ignorance. Tough, eh? So where we're at, jargon is specialised vocabulary. It encases specific meanings and how those meanings operate in one particular profession may not operate in another. So these meanings, as the words move, sometimes conflict and a whole series of misunderstandings, miscommunication emerges as these specialist words do move through space and time. So jargon is great in so many ways, because it enables precision. It is an efficient mode of communication for a particular group that enables them to go on to communicate and develop new and distinctive and elite knowledge. Now, some areas really love their jargon, and that's why we have words like legalese, right? So legal jargon, legalese, it's become its own word. But jargon, as you can see, is not slang. So jargon and slang are different things. Also, I just wanted to <laughs> make the point that jargon is also not cliches. I'm doing some work at the moment on some particularly obstructionary cliches in management and leadership 
at the moment and I'll just go through some of these cliches for you to show that these are not jargon. So I'm doing work at the moment on some really well dodgy words like actionable, <laughs> baked in, brain dump, incentivize, leverage, let's take this offline. One of my personal favorites, uh, there's like a bingo card, right? Whenever you're in a meeting and someone says, let's take this offline, you just tick and you win the internet. But also optimize, robust, siloed, and my other personal favorite, let's socialize the document. How did that ever happen? Let's socialize the document. Okay, so those sort of phrases, they're not specific. And often in management speak, those words are weaponized to intentionally obscure meaning. So you see what I'm doing here? It's not a cliche. It's not those sort of random weaponized words. Jargon has a different meaning. And they are best placed in a specific location. And the best example I can always give you is triage, okay? This is used by our wonderful colleagues out there in the medical professions, nursing health sciences, to signify a degree of in injury or indeed urgency with a particular wound or a, an illness. So triage, very specific word. The problem is that this jargon moves and moves a lot at the moment. So triage... <laughs> is used just about everywhere, just about every day. So for example, mm -mm -mm, I'm going to have to triage my mascara after that CrossFit class. Triage the mascara. Oh, look at my eyeliner. I'm going to have to triage that eyeliner. Yeah, no. Nah. So you can see that we're specifically focusing today on academic jargon. And I do want to celebrate it. I want to affirm its value because jargon exists in academic disciplines. Now, let's just be clear on academic disciplines. You know, I, I live in the post-disciplinary space, but I do want to acknowledge the value of disciplines. But I need to start with, there's nothing intrinsic to physics that separates it from philosophy, for example. And we have to recognize that academics through our history, we have built these divisions between disciplines. So a hundred years ago, and certainly a hundred and fifty years ago, the overwhelming majority of disciplines that we assume and use and discuss today didn't even exist. So disciplines are invented knowledge systems separated by jargon. So an academic discipline is a way for a scholar to frame and limit expertise in a particular way. So language is the determinant of competence. You with me? Yeah. So you will not be published in an academic journal in your discipline if you do not have the jargon. You need to have the communication terms to be able to enter that communication system and be successful. Okay, and of course, unless you've got that jargon, you will not be taken seriously. Right, so more importantly, and this is the bit where I'm quite involved in, I believe in jargon, I believe in academic jargon, because it allows scholars to communicate at a high level and continue to develop knowledge at a high level. So, yes, absolutely, academic jargon does separate out our disciplines and our knowledge systems from our citizenry. I get that. Academics are developing new knowledge through specialist research. And so, in many ways, academic jargon is really the terminology that we use to develop research. But look, I understand the critique and I hear it from so many students, some colleagues as well, but particularly PhD students that explain to me in some depth that jargon is nonsense, that why are we using all this sort of language? Let's use clear and precise language and communicate our ideas. And I probably said the same thing during my PhD as well. Okay, and I, I get that, that you want to communicate with the world and that's important and you should. 
but there is a mitigating step there that the PhD will socialise you into this jargon and this reality, and for a reason. So let me offer the alternative to your argument about jargon being obstructionary. We are academics. We are specialists in our field. We read widely. We write with precision. That's who we are. That's what we do. And therefore, the research in our particular disciplines requires a lot of precision. But where you are right is we have a much greater array of responsibilities than simply publishing in academic journals. You see, academics have what I refer to, and historically we've all referred to, as four pillars, four things we do as academics. Yes, we must research. Yes, we must teach. Yes, we must commit to what's often called university service, that is administration, management and leadership. And also the final pillar, the fourth, community service. Academics do all four. Okay, so while jargon is necessary for academics to conduct their research, we need alternative modes and modalities to enact the other three pillars. You with me? Boom. So, for example, teaching is about the dissemination of research, but we have to translate our specialist jargon to our students because they are, when they start, outsiders to our disciplines. So we have to translate our language so that we can teach them the vocabulary to become insiders in the discipline. We have to translate to teach and bring them into the discipline. Okay, then when we get to administration or management or maybe even leadership, if we're having a good day, we have to translate our academic jargon. So if we are a physicist or a biologist or a lawyer, that's great, and we have our jargon, but we have to communicate with other colleagues who might be in chemistry or English or creative arts. So they have their own jargon. So when we're doing our high quality administrative management leadership work, we have to transcend our academic jargon and we have to find those bridges to communicate between the jargon systems and between the disciplines. It's getting complicated, isn't it? Yeah. And then, of course, we get to what is, I would argue, the most important part of what we do as an academic, and that is community engagement. This is, I would argue, the most important part of what we do. And this is where the jargon issue becomes interesting. So we absolutely need a way to address and manage specific issues within our disciplines. Absolutely. But what we're deciding to do when we disseminate our research to alternative communities is we are trying to meet those communities where they are to translate our research so it is useful and usable for other communities. Crucial. So put another way, when we're dealing with a diversity of communities, our job changes. We move from being an academic to being an intellectual. Now the word intellectual gets bandied about quite a lot, but there is a way to structure this intellectual functionality. And it's about putting different adjectives in front of the word intellectual. So public intellectual, critical intellectual, or indeed organic intellectual. And all of us, by the way, should be all three of those but they have different functions. So all of these adjectives summon different goals, different modes of communication, and also different audiences. One interpretation is that the public intellectual participates in consensual knowledge generation. That is, the, the public intellectual reinforces 
the status quo. We produce knowledge that allows the social order to continue, public intellectual function. The critical intellectual function summons alternatives, alternative structures, alternative ways of living. So in other words, the critical intellectual challenges the status quo. And then of course we have the organic intellectual, right. So what is the organic intellectual? Well, the organic intellectual, the term comes from Antonio Gramsci, from the prison notebooks. And of course, Antonio Gramsci was imprisoned for his beliefs by the Benito Mussolini regime. The organic intellectual rejects the idea of the disinterested scholar, the scholar disconnected from the dirty world of everyday life. So as you can see, Gramsci critiques the traditional notion of the intellectual, the public intellectual in particular, as a person who holds general reason and holds universal truths. Gramsci argues that such a traditional intellectual simply maintains the status quo and actually reinforces the current power structures and indeed current inequalities. He argued that the unspoken assumption of such intellectual activity is to reproduce injustice. Hard truth, that one. Because I know you, as a wonderful PhD student, those of us who are academics, we don't wake up in the morning and go, great, how am I going to reinforce the patriarchy, capitalism, and heteronormativity today? Let's get into this. We don't wake up to reinforce the social, social structures. But of course we do. But the argument is actually that the traditional intellectual is pivotal to maintaining homogeneity, consensus and rationality. Our work continues the fabric of that which was in the past. So to be part of a university, to be a legitimate intellectual and speak the jargon, we have to fulfill our role. We have to know the terminology, use the temp terminology with our colleagues. And when we use that jargon, it solidifies our role in our discipline. So if you think about it, in a PhD, you're being asked to make an original contribution to knowledge. And how does that emerge? Well, you conduct a literature review. So you look at all the existing knowledge on your topic. You look at the status quo. And then you use agreed and tested methods. What's always existed in your discipline? You use those agreed methods to just extend knowledge just a little bit so that examiners can verify that you're within a discipline and you understand the jargon. But what if the literature is wrong? What if you're asking the wrong questions? What if you're simply providing the knowledge that governments, that funders want you to provide? So much of traditional education from early childhood right the way through to a PhD is repetitive, cumulative and endlessly repeating the truths of the past. Knowledge creates common sense. It also creates insiders and outsiders. The organic intellectual is different. It's a really unstable identity and volatile knowledge is created. It's not a comfortable space or place because the knowledge system that they're developing can't be housed in the disciplines because they live in between groups. Identity is relative, it's liminal, it's precious. So you can only be an organic intellectual for a finite period of time and then you may move back to the critical intellectual or indeed most of the time most of us are traditional intellectuals. 
Now, Gramsci argued that so much of education, so much of learning, involves repetition, control of the current age, and only allowing the new ideas that just extend truths a little bit and don't trouble the power structures of a time. Wow. So, of course, jargon is part of creating this consensual fabric. What we're doing, teaching generation after generation, <coughs> excuse me, is we're teaching repetitive and commonsensical knowledge. One more cough. <coughs> Sorry, guys. So for Gramsci, education has to be much more. It is disruptive and it challenges the status quo. So the organic intellectual starts to research, to challenge and create uncommon sense. Wow. So the role of the organic intellectual is to show that the truths that we have right now need to be justified, need to be explained, need to be revealed rather than simply assumed. So class-based inequality needs to be talked about rather than assume that it has always existed and it will always exist. Similarly, the incarceration rates of black citizens, particularly black men, needs to be talked about, needs to be discussed, rather than assuming this is the way it's always been. The organic intellectual is a maker, is a communicator, intervening in practice and intervening in theory. The organic intellectual at his or her best suspends common sense and reveals the provisional nature of truths, rules, theories and histories that we take for granted. And to provide an example there, I referred to men and women. What, for example, our colleagues, our organic intellectuals who are trans in the trans community or non-binary identifying, the deep truth they give us is to problematise the very nature of our language. That when we refer to men and women, that there's all sorts of communities around those terms. Difficult knowledge, unstable knowledge, important knowledge. So now is really the time, if you can, to summon the organic intellectual. To spend time thinking about communication systems. Thinking about who your audience actually is. So jargon is necessary. It shows your expertise in a discipline. You need to start there. You need to start there. But an organic intellectual is such an expert and knows their field so well that they have the capacity to translate their jargon and move it to different communi communities to discuss these ideas on the terms of the stakeholders and the audiences. Powerful. So they know their field so well that they have the capacity to translate and transform that research for new communication systems. This means powerfully that research can move, research can change, research can travel. It then becomes usable research. So the burden on us as scholars, and it is a huge burden, is we have to reach the highest intellectual standards. We must. We must master the jargon. We must. We can't miss that step. We need to show and gain the credibility of operating in our disciplines and speaking with colleagues. Peer review. Required. But then we have to know so much more 
that we're able to disseminate that research in a way that is contextually appropriate, still rig rigorous, but meaningful for citizens. So if citizens choose, they can engage with our ideas and it offers an alternative point of view, an alternative way of thinking for their consideration. So you see, I'm not suggesting that academics stop being academics. Absolutely not. I'm not suggesting for one moment that academics stop using specialist language. We really need that specialist language. But what I want you to think about is how you disseminate those ideas. Who is your audience? At the point that you configure a research design, continue the story and ask who your audiences are and what interfaces they may deploy. Because we as academics, we write to be read. We write to be read. And academics write to be read by other academics. So that's why we need jargon. We require that specialist terminology. And this research is published in scholarly journals and that is important. That is crucial to what we do. But then from there, it's necessary to do the hard yakka, the heavy lifting, and think about those alternative communication systems. And we, those of us who occupy our present, we've been given a great gift. What digitization gives to us is the capacity to, with subtlety and with care, reach all sorts of new audiences through open access journals, through podcasts, through videos such as this, through professional journalism. And therefore, wow, we can find a way to do research and connect it with the people who may use it. So what I want for you is for you to gain great credit and great pride in the mastery of jargon and know it so well that you can transcend it with ease. Thank you for hanging with me today. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out. You rock, Doug.